The structure of a distributed computing application has an architecture, which is a description of the different roles of the different programs and machines that are running in the distributed application. So the client-server architecture is perhaps the most important. The idea is that there's one server providing information to multiple clients through request and response messages. Now a client or a server isn't necessarily just a single machine, but abstractly, it's one independent role in the system. So the server role is to respond to service request with whatever requested information the client asks for. And the client role is to request information and then make use of that response. And there is some abstraction barrier here. So the client is supposed to know what service a server provides, so what it's going to do, but not how it provides that service. So that services can evolve over time and the clients don't have to change. Okay, so here's a diagram. You've got a server receiving requests and sending responses to lots of different clients. So the most important example of client-server architecture is the World Wide Web. The client is a web browser. It requests content for a location. It interprets that content for the user. And the server is a web server. It interprets the requests it receives and responds with some content. And uh, what happens, for instance, in the hypertext transfer protocol, is that the web browser and the web server start out by initializing a TCP session with exactly the same handshake that we talked about moments ago. So both know that communication in both ways is possible. Then the web browser sends a request for content and the web server responds with that content. There can be follow-up requests for auxiliary content. Now, what is a web browser really? Well, people talk about different web browsers by comparing their features, like how fast it is, or how many tabs can it support. But fundamentally, a web browser is an interpreter for lots of different programming languages. So there are a bunch of different programming languages that define the structure of web documents, how they're um, visually laid out, and then the JavaScript language is a general programming language for describing the behavior of websites, so web documents. And it can do anything. And it actually has a lot of properties in common with Python. So if you know Python, you can learn JavaScript in just a few days. Okay, so the client's an interpreter for programming languages that does things like render the web page and make sure that your game plays correctly or whatever you're trying to do on the web. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, is a protocol designed to implement this client-server architecture. So um, when you type some address in the browser, address bar of your browser, then what happens? Well, what you're supplying is called a URL, a Uniform Resource Locator, and the browser issues a GET request, which is a type of HTTP request, to the server specified here in the first part for some particular resource at some location, pages slash today's paper. The server responds, contains more than just the resource itself. It contains some status code that says, yes, today's paper really does exist, or I don't have any today's paper, or by the way, you're not allowed to access that content. And each of these has a different code. So that's a typical feature of a network protocol is that there are certain codes that have certain meanings associated with them that both the client and the server are supposed to understand. It has the date of the response, the type of server that's responding, some information about when this resource changed. So today's paper actually might change more than just once a day. And uh, the type of content and the length of the content that's going to be sent along. So that's the protocol that tells you how to send a web document is that you send all this information along with it in a header. Just to wrap up this discussion of client server architectures, there are some benefits to it. It creates a separation of concerns among the components. So the implementation of the client and the implementation of the server can change while still not disrupting the whole distributed application. Because there's an abstraction barrier between the client and the server. Okay, and then a centralized server is useful because it can reuse computation across lots of clients. 
So if today's paper has some generation involved in it, well, that like it decides how to lay out the different articles on the New York Times. Well, the centralized server can do that layout once and then remember what it came up with and send that same thing to lots of people who want to read the newspaper. But there are some liabilities. So there's a single point of, point of failure, the server. If the New York Times site decides to go down, there's no way to access that content. Computing resources become scarce when demand increases. And so it's the job of everyone who's running a service to make sure that their resources can scale with the number of users that are trying to access it. And there are lots of common use cases of this architecture which shows up just everywhere in computing. So databases are a classic one, where often you have the database serving responses to query requests over a network, as opposed to just on one machine, as we've done so far in this course. The Open Graphics Library, which is used to render most of the images in graphics-intensive applications, is actually a client-server architecture where the graphics processing unit, which is a separate processing unit in your computer, serves images to the central processing unit, which does the logic of whatever program you're trying to run. And then, of course, internet file and resource transfer, including HTTP and email and some other protocols, are all instances of the client-server architecture.